and the difference in that phenotype. Okay, so along those genes, what we have are markers, or as they are also called uh, loci. And each of these loci are markers, and there are a whole lot of them across each chromosome. At each of these loci, uh, we have, they have already identified if that locus, at a, given, at a given locus, does that recombinant inbred strain have the B form of the DNA or the D form of the DNA, okay? So they have, what they've done is they've done PCRs on little, this in fact is a PCR from a little microsatellite, just a tiny stretch of DNA, and uh, this ought to look pretty familiar to you from the Bolter Wine Master unit. Here's the molecular weight ladder, here's the loading wells, and this is, was the, the B, F0Bs, here's the F0Ds, and all these others were the uh, recombinant inbred strain, different recombinant inbred strains. And this is the very first F2 generation, okay? So some of these you can already see at this given locus have already settled in the B or the D form, all right? And so they're homozygous for that B or D form. And some of these are heterozygous at this point, but this is the first F2 strain. Okay, so if these F2s kept getting inbred at the end of 20 generations, what would you expect this banding pattern to look like? They're, in, they're either the Bs or the Ds, every last one of them, okay? Are they all going to be Bs? No. Some are going to go B, some are going to go D, all right? Now, think with me for a moment. Let's say we find... Let's go back to this. Let's say we find, uh, now here's our highly inbred strains. Um, let's say we have a marker, which would be just a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of chromosome. And it is for this one, at the tips here, it's the B, all right? Would you expect, irrespective of this diagram, would you expect the genes around there to be from the B or the D strain, and why? B, okay, because of, because <laughs> they're B. <laughs> well, you expect them to be linked, right? Because this recombination, as you can see, tends to take place in big hunks, all right? It's not like we're getting a scramble every 10 bases or something like that. It's big hunks. So very likely, if you have a B marker, the genes around there came from the B strain. If you had a D marker, the genes around there came from the D strain, all right? A tiny assumption, but it's probably right. Okay, we talked also a little bit about qualitative versus quantitative traits. I think I asked you about this on the exam. Qualitative traits, uh, did you guys have to do fly labs when you did genetics? Oh, you're so lucky, otherwise you had to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and make sure they're all virgins and all this other stuff. It's terrible. Uh, but anyway, lucky you, you didn't have to do all this, but you did probably talk about all these traits in flies, right? So red and white eyes and wrinkled versus straight wings and all this stuff. Those are qualitative traits. They're probably influenced by a single gene. They tend to follow simple patterns of inheritance. Phenotypes can be characterized in a nominal scale, so they either have red, white, red or white eyes, something like that. And usually the trait expression is typically unaffected by the environment. What we're looking at here with this QTL analysis is something that's most of the traits in the world, and that those are quantitative traits. And these tend to be influenced by multiple genes, perhaps interacting. Don't follow simple patterns of inheritance. Phenotypes are measured on a continuous, that is to say an interval scale. I say interval scale, that makes sense to all of you? You took statistics, you told me. Yes, all right, so things that, you know, at least have equal intervals among, across the different numbers. And the trait expression may be affected by the environment. So most traits that you think about in terms of human traits or even mouse traits are quantitative rather than qualitative traits. Okay. So, again, one of my first objectives was a small review of genetics. And then uh, one of my other big objectives for this unit was a review or introduction of statistical analyses and concepts. So let's talk about what we saw with regard to statistics. All right, one of the big deal things that we got into here with my buddy, uh, Sir Francis Galton, is we talked about regression, okay? And we talked about variance, and we talked about the fact 
that you can take variance and partition it into its various components, all right? And what we were wanting to do was to control uh, for the effects of sex and body weight and brain weight and age, even though we had a set of mice where we had both males and females, all kinds of different body weights, all kinds of different brain weights, huge range of ages. But we thought, oh, these variables could matter with regard to the thing we're really interested in measuring, and we don't want them to influence it. So what we're, we're going to do is go in and control for that. And what did we do to control for that? What was the name of the statistic? Say it loud. Multiple regression. Thank you. OK, so we went in. And the idea behind that is we could go in and we could take out the variance that's due to sex and take out the variance that's due to body weight and take out the variance that's due to brain weight and take out the variance that's due to age and distill those numbers down so that hopefully at the end we would have the variance that's unique to all factory bulbs, which is what we are measuring, and of course the ubiquitous error that you never quite get rid of everything. All right, so that was the idea behind this. And Sir Francis is back to remind me to say that what we did is we removed the variance successively using multiple regression. And hopefully at the end we had this variance, which was the residual variance that only pertained to olfactory bulbs. Okay. And as we made our way there to talking about multiple regression, we first talked about the case of simple linear regression. And... So we talked about the fact that the, if we had a scatter plot like this here, uh, we could draw a best fit line through that or a regression line through that. What we're trying to do with this scatter plot is predict a y value from an x value. So we want to find the line that best fits and minimizes the squared deviations in the y value. Okay? This all comes back to you? Great. All right, so that's the best fit line or the regression line or what's also called the least squares line. And so in our case, we talked about the fact uh, here we have olfactory bulb volume and body weight, and we want to get rid of the variance that's due to body weight. So we also talked about the fact if this variable body weight predicted nothing about olfactory bulb volume, let's just pretend it didn't, uh, then what would be the best predictor, the best y value that you could have? The mean, right. Okay, so if this doesn't predict anything, then the best predictor is the mean of y. So we're going to see if our variable did any better than just the mean of y. And so our regression line is, is here. The predicted y's then are the y hats, okay? And I particularly picked this little point here, happy face point. Uh, to show how this works. So we can see that actually our, we did have a, uh, a relationship between the two variables because the line isn't flat. And we can also see uh, that we did a little bit better uh, on happy face point than just picking the mean. In fact, so here's the whole variation of, of happy face away from the mean. And this much of it, of this variation, uh, was predicted by body weight. Okay, does that make sense? All right. So that's great. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through this plot and do this for every last point, grab that variation that's due to body weight and haul it out and thereby control for body weight. Okay? And take the influence of body weight out. Of course, we didn't predict, not everything was predicted by body weight. That which is not predicted for this particular point contributes to the residual. Okay, and for us, the residual is what's valuable because our, hopefully our variance that's due just to olfactory bulbs is going to be in that term. Okay, uh, I'm going to put this slide back up to remind you, usually one uses regression to predict something and the residual is the trash. For us, it's going to be the treasure, all right, but usually the residual is the trash. Uh, and